Governor Dukakis, Mr. President, Minister Taro Kono, thank you so much for the honour of speaking with you today. And let me apologise at once for speaking with you virtually. Believe me when I say I am there with you in spirit. Given the turmoil of our capital today, I am yearning for the calm of your campus. It's a campus that I remember with tremendous love. I was newly married to Sarah and around our little nest on Cambridge Street, the dot-com revolution appeared to be changing the very laws of economics, the rules of business, the very codes and norms of society. But revolutions are rarely predictable. And we did not predict the profound change in the balance of power between nation and nation, and of course between rich and poor. 30 years ago, I remember standing in the pouring rain in a Harvard car park, pleading with a professor to let me into a course on how you built information age business. Today, as a politician, I'm talking to you about how we tame that business power. As a student, it felt like we were living in a, an era of change. As a politician, it feels like we're living in a change of era. What our powers of prophecy failed to forecast was the effect of a three-way merger. The merger between the great information age, the merger between the age of American hyperpower, and of course, the legacy of 30 years of liberal economics. Those changes have combined to now provoke some significant challenges for this new era. And that challenge was spelt out for me best by a very senior Financial Times economist here in London. The challenge of this new era, he said, is whether the world is going to become more Hobbesian or more Rawlsian. Are we going to find a way, following John Rawls, of finding new ways to spread the benefits and spread the burdens of new possibilities? Or are we looking at a Hobbesian world, a nightmare of all against all. Speaking to a Harvard audience, I thought I'd better explain why it is that I think John Rawls can win the day. Let me explain the challenges before I offer a few answers. After victory in the Cold War, we were left with America and its allies in NATO as the world's only hyperpower. But this age of asymmetry was always going to provoke an insurgency. And so it proved. From Al-Qaeda to active measures, malign actors have sought to use technology to radicalise, to terrorise and to paralyse, exploiting the online world to slow discourse, to inflame two sides of any argument, in short, to divide and to rule. But the second challenge is not foreign, it's actually domestic. Technology plus the free markets that we created in the 1980s have spawned what we now see today, the super giants of the global economy. These companies are so big that they're able to bend market outcomes and bend them towards inequality. That inequality is the rocket fuel of populism, the very populism that our enemies seek to inflame. It was Joseph Schumpeter, uh, another Harvard thinker, who predicted this. Everyone remembers his famous axiom that capitalism is driven by creative destruction. But everyone forgets the corollary, which is the destruction of competition. And that is what we now face today. The rise of what I've called technopolies is, can be seen across the digital economy. These are superstar for firms, which economists like David Auter and others have explained drive down labour's share of market income. So if we put together this age of insurgency and this age of technopoly, we do indeed have the makings of a Hobbesian world. I don't think that this status quo can last for very long. It is simply too unstable. This House of Commons today feels unstable. But nor do we want, even if we could have it, a Chinese approach of much stronger central state control. What we have to do is we have to find a middle way through this, and I think it's John Rawls who should be our guide. Rawls had a brilliant idea, the idea of the overlapping consensus to describe the way that we construct the law of peoples and crystallise the rights which are equal to each. It is this overlapping consensus that I think 
that we need today. It's a new consensus that we should enshrine in rights for the digital age. A bill, if you like, of digital rights. Perhaps a 34th Amendment to your constitution, or here, a new convention for our Council of Europe. Now, the content of this Novus Charter should reflect the different roles that all of us take on in life. The role of a citizen, the role of a worker, the role of a consumer, the role of a parent, and yes, our life as a child. Let me start with our basic rights as citizens, because it is perhaps here that we face the most dangerous of paradoxes. The social networks that were built to nurture sweet talk have now become echo chambers of hate speech. As humans, we love to connect, but we fear to be different. So those who want to play the part of a digital Mephistopheles and entice us into supporting an agenda not of building bridges but walls, well, they don't have to work very hard. And countries like Russia know this. Their dark social playbook, a playbook that connects hackers, fake news sites, troll farms, and dark money, pumping ads around Facebook groups targeted with psychographic precision thanks to firms like Cambridge Analytica, take apart old defences of democracy for the very simple reason that our laws are out of date. So we should update those laws. Here in the UK, we're looking very hard at ideas like the Feinstein Bill, which would require social networks to report the glorification or acts preparatory to acts of terrorism. We're looking hard at Germany's Netz DG law, which has worked so well in taking down hate speech in Germany. We're looking hard at proposals from Senator Warner to propose a duty on platforms to clearly and conspicuously label bots to protect consumers and to stop bots amplifying disinformation. Plus, a duty to determine the origin of posts and accounts, an absolutely crucial step that bad actors are not allowed to abuse free speech in the arena of our democracy. As citizens, we bear the right to be fully informed, and that needs enshrining for the digital age. Second, as workers, I think we face both one of the biggest opportunities and the biggest threats in living memory. Automation could affect something like 1.2 billion of the world's 3.5 billion workers. And it would be naive of us to think that that change is not going to be disruptive. It's the challenge which I've called the Harry Bridges test. The legendary president of the American Dockers Union, he earned his spurs during the difficult and sometimes brutal 1934 strike. But it was the mechanization of the 1960s that really provoked him to ask what I think is the essential question. How do we win for our members a piece of the machine? The challenge, said Bridges, was how we get machines working for the workers rather than against them. And that is the challenge that we have today. Without rights to a genuine minimum living wage, without a right to retraining, without a right to algorithmic justice to stop the automation of discrimination in hiring and firing and managing in the workplace, we are never going to create the project hope that we need for the future of automation. Third, in the marketplace for consumers, we have got to act now to protect the freedom of choice by protecting the reality of competition. In many parts of our economy, but in particular in the digital world, that notion of competition is moving, quite frankly, from theory to fantasy. The founding father of economics, Adam Smith, who hailed from not far from here, had a lot to say about the dangers of monopoly. This is what he wrote. People of the same trade, he said, seldom meet together, even for merriment and diversion, but the conversation ends in a conspiracy against the public or in some contrivance to raise prices. Well, this summer, it was the IMF which revealed just how stark that contrivance has now become. When they looked at the markups in prices across advanced economies since the 1980s, they found an incredible 40 plus percent increase. That reflects the diminishing quality of competition across the advanced West. It is a sign that competitive forces are now waning. And I don't think that that should necessarily surprise us. At the Harvard Business School, just down the road from you, 
I wasn't trained to uh, protect competition. I was trained to destroy it. That is how we reward our corporate chieftains today. Well, I remember Michael Porter teaching me the essence of strategy formulation is coping with competition. Well, now technology is being used to systematically destroy competition. The world's two and a half thousand companies, the largest firms on earth, now account for 90% of global research and development. The top 500 firms control an incredible 82% of that total. They're using that spend to undercut competition and build data monopolies that lock in their customers for the future. Yet, today's competition rules don't touch this. Facebook, for example, has bought 69 companies since 2007. When they bought WhatsApp in a deal worth $13 billion, the turnover thresholds weren't big enough to trigger merger control. Yet Facebook acquired control of a billion WhatsApp accounts to add to its data pile. The risk of data monopolies is now serious and the competition rules need updating to protect our rights as consumers in this digital age. The fourth set of rights are our rights as parents. As parents, we have rights to honour because we have duties to honour, duties to our children. That means that we have duties to safeguard our children's welfare where they now spend so much time, online. This is not a marginal issue. About a third of online users are now children. And I think it is fair to say that the founders of America did not intend the rights of free speech to act to undermine the healthy instruction of our children. Now, legislating in this area is, quite rightly, very difficult. But if we owe a duty of care to our children, then surely companies owe a duty of care to our children too. If I went out today and built a physical arena somewhere in London and filled it up with lots of people, then quite rightly, I would be asked to follow all kinds of safety procedures. And yet, if I build an online arena and fill it with people, I'm under no such obligations. What this now means is that in virtual arenas, we see the growth of new and dangerous harms. For example, the suicide games, which we have seen spreading around social media platforms, like the Blue Whale Challenge. It's a dangerous game. It goads children into challenges, and they might start off with, as innocuous, but they steadily escalate into acts of self-harm. Despite Instagram's awareness of that challenge shared across its platforms, this game has been linked to over 100 teenage deaths in Russia, and the game has spread to the United Kingdom and indeed to India. I think it is time that we impose the same duties of care on social media firms by asking them to set out the harms which they know uh, they are at risk of creating and inspecting them on taking appropriate steps to combat those harms. We should insist too that the rights of children do not stop at their screens. The rights of children have digital dimensions too, the right to informed use, the right to be safe, and crucially, and this will be one of the biggest debates for the future, the right to universal digital literacy. Finally, as we know, rights always have to be matched by responsibilities. Changes in technology will bring changes in the responsibilities for many. And that has always been the way. When Michael Faraday, the great British scientist, was trying to explain electricity to William Gladstone, it's fair to say it wasn't a happy conversation. Gladstone was struggling to make sense of this extraordinary new phenomenon that Faraday was trying to explain. But, he said, after all, what is the use of it, said Gladstone to the exasperated scientist. And pausing for thought, Faraday said, well, sir, there is every possibility that you will soon be able to tax it. Technology giants today like to move fast and break things, but someone has to put back together society. That isn't free, it's expensive, and that is why we need social media and technology firms to step up to their responsibilities to pay their
taxes. Governor, I want to conclude by acknowledging that many of the changes that I propose here will provoke cries of rage, not least cries of anguish in parts of Silicon Valley. But rights, as Madison knew, are never immutable. They must evolve and they must change as a society makes progress. Madison noted in the Federalist Papers that some rights result from the nature of our life together, the compact that we have for living together. Trial by jury, for example, was never a natural right, but a right that resulted from a social compact which regulates the action of the community as essential to secure the liberty of the people as any one of the pre-existing rights of nature. Of all the lessons that I learned at Harvard, perhaps the most important was the lesson of the power of enterprise to change the world for good. In my, in my own study of the change makers in British history, what I found is that entrepreneurs make history by inventing the future. But if we want that future to be a place of hope and of opportunity for all, then we have to remember that the task of politicians is to shape the market to the society we want, not let the market dictate the society that we have. That is why lawmakers and change makers today must now join forces to reshape those wise constraints that make us free. And I hope John Rawls would approve. Thank you very much.